Your source for everything paranormal. Parasex. Throughout the ages, history has been altered by word of mouth and the misrepresentation of those who might not have been present when some of the world's most significant events took place. Channelers Barry and Connie Strom bring through the spirits of those who actually witnessed or took part in these historical events and lets them tell their stories in their own words. Welcome to Channeling History. And now, here are your hosts, Barry and Connie Strom. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Channeling History. We're the only show where we speak to the guests that are on the other side. And we're brought to you every week on Sundays by the Para-X Radio Network. We're not going to be taking any questions tonight from the chat room as we pre-recorded the show due to another commitment. Next week, we will be re returning to our usual live format and channel the 26th President of the United States, Teddy Roosevelt. You can join us in the chat room at that time. I'm Barry Strom, your host, and I'll be doing the channeling tonight. And I'm Connie Strom, your co-host, and I would like to thank you all for tuning in to our show this evening. Tonight, we'll be talking to Martin Luther. In the 16th century, he split from the teachings of the Catholic Church and created the Protestant Reformation. We've prepared questions for our guest tonight, and as Barry stated, we will not be taking any questions from the chat room this evening. If you listened to us before, you know that we've always give a small disclaimer when we begin the shows, we've no idea how the spirit guests will answer or give opinions. And I know some of the opinions we're going to hear tonight, there's going to be people disagree with. So the opinions or statements voiced on our show are the channeled words of the spirits and do not necessarily reflect our opinions, those of the Parax Network or our sponsors. If you've listened to our show, you know that channeling history is very different from other shows. I believe Barry mentioned that. Uh, we only speak to spirits that have contributed to historic events or are holy spirits or archangels. Last week, we interviewed the soul of Paul Newman. He was best known as an actor, but he also created a food line named Newman's Own that gives all of its profits to charity. Since its inception, the company has contributed over a half a billion dollars to charity. If you missed it, the show is available on our YouTube channel. In our future shows, we'd really like to interview spirits as recommended by our listeners. So please submit suggestions for future shows or questions for our spirit guests to our email. It's channeling history on para x at gmail.com. That's channeling history on para x at gmail.com. If you've also listened to our show before, you'll know that whenever we channel, we say a prayer of protection. There's evil out there. We want to make sure that we're protected when we open the channel to the other side. So Connie's now going to say the prayer, and we will begin our channeling with the spirit that was Martin Luther. God, please grant us your wisdom and protection. Grant us the knowledge that we can handle and keep us safe from those things that will harm us. Keep the messages positive and pure love. Keep us safe from our egos. We ask these things in the light of the seen, the unseen, and the honesty of God. Okay, Martin, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, would you like to begin with a message? Absolutely. It's not often I get to talk to the people. I enjoyed the last time that we had channeled together. And I have quite a bit I'd like to say tonight. In my time, it was very, very difficult. It was the 16th century People were very, very poor. They were uneducated. The rich were ruling over the whole peasant class. <clears throat> and it was a very, very difficult time for individuals to make a living. There were many people, including the Pope and church members, that were taking care of the poor. The church would get even the poorest peasants to donate money to them. They would use that money to build buildings, and they were also already incredibly rich. There were many things that were taking place, and the one church system was reaching a breaking point. I was sent back to try to correct many of these things. I did my best, 
And I think in many ways we really succeeded. So I know you have many questions. I've actually helped you prepare them. So, Connie, I'm ready to answer them. Thank you. Uh, could you start out with telling us about your parents? It was a time of very large families. And my father and mother were really very good people. He had a very successful business and had access to money. So he could send me to some of the best schools and we could do many of the things that other people didn't have the opportunity to do. So I had a very good family and I got along well with my brothers and sisters. And it was a, a very, very good time for me in spite of the, all of the troubles that were going on around us. Okay, could you uh, go a little further in depth on letting us know what religion was like in the 16th century? At the time I was born, the Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church controlled basically all of the religions. Now there were other areas of the world where other religions thrived. I know Muhammad had started the Islamic religion. The Jewish religion predated the Catholic Church. But in Germany, where I grew up, basically everything other than, than what the Jewish population were doing was controlled by the Catholic Church. In many ways, there were many problems with the church. I didn't realize them in my youth, but if you wanted to go to heaven, the church told you you had to do it through their sacraments. They were extracting money from the people and they were speaking their sermons in Latin. Most of the people could not understand a word of what they were saying because they spoke German in my area. It was part of the church's plan that individuals would believe that the only salvation could come through the Roman Catholic Church. As I studied and learned more and more, I found that my personal beliefs were indeed differing from what the church was preaching. So it was a very, very, very difficult time for religious freedom. Okay, could you tell us a little more about your education, please? My father wanted me to enter the legal profession. He sent me to some very good schools. I learned Latin and I learned a lot of the things that I would need in order to study to become an attorney. I actually began my studies, but something happened to me that I decided that I would drop all of it and join a monastery. So I had a very good education. I was relatively intelligent and I could learn a lot. I read many of the, uh, I read many of the ancient documents. I did much as I could in order to further myself. But I changed my mind, and now you know what the results of what finally took place. I definitely do. I grew up in the Lutheran Church. Okay, are you a member of the Soul Family of God? Absolutely. There are many of us that are in the seventh level, that we are close to the energies of God, and I was a member of that. God chose to send me back to introduce a different concept of organized religion. He realized that his messages were being diluted by those who sought more power in the Catholic Church. So he thought it was a time that the individuals that were following Christianity would have more choices. Had you reincarnated before you incarnated as Martin Luther? Yes, I believe one other lifetime as a human. I was sent back to assist 
our Lord when he reincarnated, and I was one of his followers. I was not one of the 12 so-called closest disciples, but I helped spread his words after his passing. The disciples told me of the resurrection, and I tried to live my life assisting the different disciples and to help spread the words that he had spoken. In 1505, you abandoned your law studies and joined a monastery. What caused this to happen? I was traveling along a road, and all of a sudden this terrible thunderstorm came up. There was a lightning strike that hit very close to me. I was petrified. I thought that I was going to die. And I swore that if they let me live through this day, that I would join a monastery and spread the words of God. I lived through that day, obviously, and I lived up to my oath. I swore that I would do it, so I quit my school. I stopped learning to be an attorney, and I actually joined a monastery. What was your opinion of the Augustinian order? The Augustinians were a group of really good people. They were obviously Catholic, and they listened to the rulings of the Pope. But many of them spent most of their days simply trying to pray, meditate, and do many things that they felt brought them closer to God. So even though it was a Catholic group, I learned much from them. It sounds like a good gang to hang out with. As a monk, you fasted, you flagellated yourself, you went without sleep and many other things. Now that you're on the other side, does this type of practice really help when you return to heaven? All of the things which I did are not required when you return to heaven. It was thought in my, in, in my times that if you emulated the sufferings of Jesus, that it would help you become closer to him and it would help you enter heaven. Now that I'm over here, I understand that the main criterion is how you live your life and how you help others, how you show love. It is possible to do very well when you return in your judgments and not have participated in any of the activities that I did at that time. Now, I'm not accepting, or I'm not saying that prayer and meditation aren't very important because that isn't one way that you can actually communicate with your spirit guides or angels, or sometimes even uh, our Lord himself. But all of the all of the punishments that I put my body through were not required. What do you consider the greatest gift that God gave humans? God gave humans many, many blessings. You only have to look around to understand them. But I think that the greatest gift that God gave humans was the gift of faith. Humans have the ability to totally believe in, in something without seeing it, feeling it, or even hearing it. Many people have incredible faith in God, even though they have never had physical proof that he does truly exist. Now that I'm on the other side, I can guarantee to you that he actually does truly exist. But I think the gift of faith to the humans is one of the most important things that he ever gave. Yeah. The Catholic Church felt that salvation came through the sacraments of the church. When you became a monk, you must have agreed with that concept. What changed you? I was very young when I joined the monastery. And in many instances, I was very naive about the workings of the church. As I became more and more familiar with the edicts that were coming down from the Pope and how he was trying to drain the money from the poor, I became more and more frustrated 
with the Catholic Church. It was only after I learned all that was going on around me that I decided that there were things with which I felt strong disagreement. Did you have any other strong differences with the rulings of the Pope in Rome those days? Well, in the early days, I did not get the attention of the Pope, obviously, as a living life of a single monk. As I grew older, the individuals that were in control of the monastery realized that I had a good speaking ability, that I was very intelligent. And I began doing things that would draw attention to myself. Once I did, once I posted how I differed with the Catholic Church, it word of the of what I was doing was received by the Pope, and as I found out, it infuriated him. So I did as my age increased and my preaching abilities and all of the things that go into coming up with the ideas that I contrast with, with which I contrasted with the church, he became more and more angry with me. So I had many, many differences with the belief because all the Pope wanted to do was to support the church and to bring in as much money into the coffers as possible. Okay. So what happened that ended up with you calling him the Antichrist? As things worsened with my relationship with the formal church, they actually excommunicated me and ruled that I was a heretic. In those days, when they ruled that you were a heretic, you would be killed. So I was not real excited about the fact that the Pope wanted me to be executed. My anger with the church grew and grew, especially as I became older. And his beliefs in so many ways, I felt, were in contrast to what the teachings of God were, that I actually thought of him as being the Antichrist. So at this point in time, what was your opinion of the Catholic Church? I became more and more frustrated with it. When they called me to the city of Worms in Germany, I expected that I would be receiving a free trial and that I would be able to speak my mind truthfully. And I really felt that everything would be fine. As it turned out, none of that would take place. They knew how the meeting was going to go. And I think they even had the edict prepared before they heard any of my words. So by the time they declared me a heretic, I was very, very upset with the Catholic Church. Okay. Will you tell us about the Catholic Church's practice of the purchase of a letter of indulgence? The Catholic Church came up with the concept of purgatory. They told the people that it was a place that they held the souls of their family members. And if they wanted that soul to, pro to progress from purgatory into heaven, that they would have to purchase what they referred to as a letter of indulgence. It was just another way that the church was shaking down the people to raise more money. I felt that the letter of indulgent concept was a terrible practice. I did not think that entrance into heaven and forgiveness of sins was something that could be purchased. Could you tell us about the existence of purgatory? Very simple. There is no purgatory. Upon passing, your soul enters directly into heaven. Now, there are souls who can make the decision to stay earthbound. Sometimes they're afraid of judgment or they have not been properly indoctrinated into what is ahead for them. But 
there is absolutely no purgatory where souls are held, are held where individuals have to purchase a pass to get them into heaven. Okay, you taught that the Bible's the sole guide in matters of morality and belief. Now that you're back on the other side, do you believe differently? Yes and no. I know now that the Bible provides the best existing foundation for the teachings of Jesus. I also understand how the, how the church has added and altered to his teachings through the years. You need to look at the Gospels as a broad foundation on which to build your life. Generally, when there are things in the Bible that seem impossible to believe, it's part of what the church has added. Most notable to the verses that have been added through the years is Revelations. There is actually nothing in Revelations that is accurate. That was added hundreds and hundreds of years after Jesus walked the earth, and it was introduced by the church so that people would fear and would rely upon the church to provide a passage into heaven. The church introduced the concept of hell. In the early days, the worst of tortures was to be burned. So they incorporated the fact that a soul would be burning in hell for eternity. And that was used to scare people into relying upon the sacraments of the Catholic Church for forgiveness and to provide them access to heaven. None of that is true. Just the same as the concept of the end of days was presented so that people would rely more heavily on the church because they were thinking that obviously the end of the world was coming and they, their soul would have to be delivered from sin. But there are many, many things that the church has introduced through the years that have absolutely nothing to do with your soul passing into heaven. Remember that the most important thing is how you live your life, show love to others and help others and charity and all the things of the simple messages that you're receiving. And your soul will do quite fine. You do not have to worry that there will be an end of days that's created by God. There may be an end of days that is created by humans, but God is not going to destroy all that he has worked so hard to have evolve. So just remember, I'm not speaking against all the things of the Bible. And when I lived, I thought everything was 100% correct. But I do want you to know that there are things in the Gospels that are not to be believed. You taught that the Roman Catholic Church's insistence on clerical celibacy was the work of the devil. Could you explain, please? I could never find anything in the Gospels that proved that members of the church had to remain celibate, that they couldn't marry. I knew from documents, and in the early days of the church, marriage was encouraged for the clergy. It was only after the women became more powerful and were trying to influence the rulings of the church that they ruled that their priests and leaders should not be married and should remain chaste. I also knew that the leaders were not following that advice and that they were doing many of the things that they were telling their parishioners not to do and that they were telling their fellow priests not to do. So I felt truly that the devil had affected the church when they made that decision. Remember in my day, we thought very simply of things. There was a devil, there was, there was good, there was evil. The devil was a personification of evil. 
And I felt that that command was evil. So therefore it had to be the result of influence by the devil. Many of your pronouncements were anti-Jewish. Why did you take such an anti-Semitic position? I did not take that position towards the people. What I took the position from was the teachings of the Jewish church. Remember that the Jewish religion never accepted our Lord as Messiah. I thought that was a terrible thing because I never had any doubt in my mind that Jesus had lived and that he was truly the Messiah that was sent from God. I felt that by the church telling the members that Jesus was simply a human, that it was a prophet or whatever he was thought of by the church, but he was never acknowledged as the Son of God or as the Messiah. I felt that was a terrible, terrible thing because they were influencing the minds of many against what I truly believed in. So that was the reason. I spoke very strongly against the Jewish church, but I tried not to speak strongly against the members of the church. What was your opinion of true repentance? I felt that true repentance could only take place through the heart of an individual. The church was teaching that true repentance could only take, through, take place through the sacraments of the church. I felt that each individual had the right to make his own decisions and ask for forgiveness without having to rely upon the sacraments of the Catholic Church. Could you explain your doctrine of justification? I felt that each individual should justify in their own heart their faith and how they wanted to pursue the future of their souls when it entered heaven. I felt that it was not in the church's place to justify if an individual would be going to heaven or not. Okay. When you were on the other side, what was your opinion on faith? When you were on this side. <laughs> Sorry. When I was walking the earth, I felt that faith was in the heart of an individual. I felt that faith was between that individual and God. I never felt that any church should be placed in a position between the heart of the individual and how that soul would, would enter heaven. Okay, you obviously had a lot of disagreements with the Pope, but what was your basis for your greatest disagreement with him? That is very hard to narrow down. He basically disagreed with all of my concepts. I thought that an individual would be free to make his own decisions concerning his life and how he lived them. The Pope felt that the church had the right to bleed the money from the people to control their actions, to even limit what they understood of the teachings of God. I mentioned before that they spoke the sermons in Latin so that nobody would understand them. I think that it's a general concept of what I differed most with from the Pope. I did not agree that the church should control everything in the lives of any individual. And I felt that how an individual lives his life should not be dictated totally by the church. Okay, let's take a little bit of a break here. We'll be right back. And then we will have more from Martin Luther. Don't go away. Channeling History will return right after these brief messages. Get my, get my, get my. 
in order for the light to shine so brightly, the darkness must be present. Tune in every Monday at 10 o'clock. The Dark Sun Rising on the Para-X Radio Network. From Haunted Road Media comes an exciting new novel by author Marla Brooks. Soul Connection, a deadly obsession. Two lost souls ripped apart by murder in another century find each other again in the present only to discover that the murderer has followed them through time. Can their love save them or will history repeat itself? Find out in this captivating new novel by Marla Brooks, Soul Connection, A Deadly Obsession. Available now on Amazon.com and at BarnesandNoble.com. You've no doubt heard of Tango and Cash. Whiskey, Tango, Foxtrot. Perhaps it takes two to tango. Well, now, on the first and third Thursdays of each month, there's a show called Tango and Friends at 8 p.m. Eastern on the Para-X Radio Network with your host, Bruce Tango. And yes, there will be at least two to tango on each episode, sometimes even more. There's going to be lots of topics and lots of guests you'll all know and lots of surprises. Tango and Friends, every first and third Thursday of the month at 8 p.m. right here on the Para-X Radio Network. Have you ever wondered what Jesus and his followers would say if you could receive their messages today? In his new book, Spirit Speak, Channeling Jesus and the Holy Spirits, channeler and author Barry Strom answers those questions for you. Using his gift of spirit communication, he brings you messages from such Holy Spirits as Moses, John the Baptist, Mary Magdalene, Mother Mary, Jesus, and even Mother Teresa and the Reverend Billy Graham. They discuss topics that are important for contemporary life in these troubled times. Spirits Speak, Channeling Jesus and the Holy Spirits is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and other booksellers. Signed copies are available on the author's website, spiritspredict.com. After reading this book, you will never again say, what would Jesus say or do? Welcome back to Channeling History. Now, here are your hosts, Barry and Bonnie Strom. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, a short break, and now we are ready to have more and more questions answered by Martin Luther. Okay, getting back to that uh, assembly in Worms, Germany, what went through your head when the Edict of Worms declared you a heretic, an outlaw, and that you should be killed? Needless to say, I was incredibly upset. It was not what I was expecting. I thought that I would be receiving an honest trial. I thought that people would listen to me. And I thought that many of the thoughts that I had and were very well founded. The Pope had his mind made up before it ever took place. And I was incredibly upset. How did you respond to it? I actually had to hide out for almost a year. I knew that there were many that would choose to kill me if they found out where I was and what I was doing. I did use that year to do a lot of writing and to give a lot of meditation and thought to what I was going to do when I truly re was able to go back to somewhat of a normal life. Okay, in 1524, you married an ex-nun, Katerina. What got you interested in becoming a married man? I truly never thought that I would marry. I was very busy with what I was doing. One day I received this letter from a nun, Katrina, and she was asking me how to leave the nunnery and to leave the strict life that she was, was living. She had read of my teachings and she had agreed with much of it. And there were a bunch of friends of hers also that wanted to leave the monastery. So I tried and succeeded in finding a way for her to leave. At the time that she became a person freed of the, of 
the requirements of the church, I started to realize that I had a deep affection for her. She was quite a bit younger than I was, but she had a wonderful mind. She could logic things out. She was very well organized. And I suddenly realized that I wanted to marry her. Was she a member of your soul family? Yes, absolutely. She was sent back to assist me in my work. We have actually lived multiple lifetimes together, not on this planet, but in other worlds. Okay. In medieval times, women were treated as secondary citizens. How did you feel women should be treated? In my youth, I just naturally assumed that women were there to have children. The church actually held them in secondary positions as nuns. They did not give the women the opportunity to advance in the church. I felt as I aged that women had an awful lot to offer and that they were as intelligent as any man. Once I married, I firmly believed that women were truly equal to men in all things. I truly loved my wife, and she was a rock upon which I would rely when many, many things looked to be very bad. Okay, when you started your own uh, religion, how did you redefine faith? Faith. I truly felt that faith was between an individual and God. I felt that if an individual wanted to truly find redemption and forgiveness, that he should be able to speak to God through prayer and ask for himself how he could find forgiveness and how he could live a normal life and gain access to heaven. Kate, okay, when you began to have such strong disagreements with the Catholic Church, did you realize that you were going to be starting a new organized religion? Absolutely not. I felt that the church would listen to some of the words that I was speaking and would help modify their policies. I found out that that was absolutely not the fact. I found out that there was nothing that I could do to alter what the church was doing. They had actually excommunicated me and threw me out of the church and wanted me dead. So once I was excommunicated, things changed for me. An excommunicated individual does not have the right to approach members of the church or even to discuss policy. They're on the outside of the church looking in. So I tried to formalize a lot of my concepts, and I preached to others what I believed. In many respects, your new church was very similar to the Catholic Church. Why? I felt that there was no way that the individuals could make a, a clean break of all that they had learned for many, many years. Keep in mind at this point, the Catholic Church had controlled the minds of people for almost 1,500 years. I felt that I could incorporate what I felt was good from the Catholic Church and add what I felt my teachings would bring to the individuals, which was in contrast to the teachings of the church. Why did you decide to translate the Bible into German? I felt that the people had a right to understand the written word of the Gospels. The average person was uneducated and had absolutely no way to learn the Latin language. I was born and raised in Germany, so I started to, to translate the Gospels into German. Once I established Bibles in the German language, 
many individuals were able for the first time in their lives to truly read the words of God as it is presented in the Gospels. In 1524, many peasants in Western and Southern Germany, as a result of your teachings, invoked divine law to gain freedom from oppression by the nobles and landlords. Over 100,000 peasants were killed. Why did you oppose the peasants' war? The peasants wanted to uprise using violence. I did not approve of the fact that they were actually raising militias on their own and wanted to try to physically overthrow the nobles and the established way of government. I felt that the true way to, to have changed was through nonviolent means. So I actually sided with the nobles, but I did not approve of the great violence that they brought against the peasants. It is true that many, many people were killed, many of the poor people, many innocent people fed their families. It turned out that they had used my words as a foundation for attempting to improve conditions and to find, equ and to find equality. I was very sorry that they chose the violent path because I did not feel that the governmental structure should be totally overthrown. What was your opinion of the Muslim religion? I did not understand a lot of the Muslim religion, but I knew that they did not have Jesus as one of their leaders. I knew that the prophet Muhammad had given them a lot of information that they had incorporated into the Quran. But once again, same as with the Jewish religion, they did not accept the fact that Jesus was the Messiah and that he had been sent back to bring the people a new faith. They, I put them in the same category as the Jewish religion, simply because they did not believe that Jesus was a true uh, prophet. I felt that there was nothing wrong with the people of the faith. But once again, their basic teachings were amiss in not accepting Jesus as the Messiah. What was your opinion of having multiple wives? I could find nothing in the Gospels that prohibited individuals from having multiple wives. It was a time where many people would die at a fairly early age and the women would be left without any means of support. I did not see anything wrong with, an with a man bringing another woman into the household so that he could support the family and her children. So I could, since I could find nothing in the gospels that opposed it, I did not feel that it was a religious matter for whether an individual took multiple women into their homes. The Catholic Church opposed divorce. What was your opinion on this subject? I could also find nothing in the Gospels that supported the Catholic Church position on divorce. The fact that many individuals were very, very unhappy in their relationship meant to me that they should be able to each move on and to pursue a happier life. When, an in, when two individuals are happy together, they show love to and faith to their children and other family members. 
if they're unhappy together, they show the opposite. And those children learn the anger that comes with an unhappy relationship. So I did not feel that divorce, since it was not supported in the original Gospels, was something that should be enforced by the church. Uh, in those days, did you believe that the end of the world was imminent? Yes. I believed that Revelations was true. I felt that there would be an end of days, and I felt that it would not be far off because I believed with all my heart that the Catholic Church had been taken over by evil forces. That is one of the reasons I called the Pope the Antichrist. I felt that the leadership of the church was going to destroy the entire world, and I felt that it would take place when Jesus became frustrated and that there would be an end of days. What is your opinion of the current uh, Lutheran church? I think that in many ways, the Lutheran church is a very good institution. But I also believe that in many ways, there are things that the church could change for the better. I think that the church could simplify their message. I think that if they spent a lot of more time on speaking of love, family relationships, etc., that more and more people would attend the church. I see that many people are refraining from joining organized religions. Some of this is through the belief that technology proves that there is no God. That is something that each individual will find out on their day of passing. I think that the Lutheran Church should adapt a much more simpler doctrine. I think that they should try to unite all the members of their church. I think that they need to show understanding. I realize that there are some splits in the Lutheran Church. There are many people that are very conservative Christians, and there are people that are much more liberal. The church needs to find a path that unites all people. Okay, what is your opinion of the current Catholic Church, and what message would you have for the current Pope? We watch what is taking place in the Catholic Church from this time, and in many instances, we are quite upset. Allowing the church members to violate the youth that were members and take advantage of them was a terrible thing. And the church actually failed to step in and punish those that were responsible until public pressures became so, so great that they were forced to take action. What happened in the church? has driven many, many people away from membership and from attending the Catholic Church. The Pope needs to take very firm stands on things. He needs to accept a basic foundation that the teachings of God are the foundations upon which any religious institution should be, should be built. He needs to separate religion and politics. In many instances, the proper decision in a religion is in much contrast to political decisions that are taking, around, taking place around the church. He needs to acknowledge this, and he needs to act in a manner that brings people back to the church. They need to understand many of the concepts that I tried to introduce. There is only a single God, and that God has created all of the great religions of the world. 
that God has very, very simple teachings. Have the people understand those simple teachings, and it will bring them back into the church. Okay, now that you're on the other side, has your opinion changed about any of your teachings? Yes, absolutely. As I alluded to earlier, I felt that the gospel was a written in stone institution upon which all teachings of all the teachings of God should be built. I did never truly realized how many of the of the writings had been altered through the years. I need people to understand that the teachings of God are actually much more simple than the way things are presented in the Gospels. For instance, when Jesus walked the earth, he never spoke in parables. Parables were introduced so that the average individual would not understand the teaching, and they would have to rely upon the church to, to define the meaning of that parable. That is not the true way that God wants things. He wants it to be simple. He wants everyone to understand his words and teachings. And he wants each individual to find faith in his heart, understand prayer and conversation with God or the angels, and to live a good life. It can almost be that simple. What would you tell us about the forgiveness of God? God is all forgiving. He will choose when an individual truly feels in his heart that forgiveness is warranted. God wants to forgive. He doesn't want individuals to be in the lower levels of heaven. He wants them to advance. The reason being, when people advance in the realms, they truly understand his teachings. They've done good. They do a lot of, of things that bring others to understand his words. He wants to forgive. Even a woman that has had an abortion can find forgiveness if she understands that what she did is contrary to the teachings of God and understands her mistakes and feels true remorse over it. Never believe that your soul cannot be forgiven. Many, many people have done many things. Think of St. Paul. He actually crucified Christians. He was led to forgiveness because when God appeared to him, he fully realized what he had done was wrong. And he dedicated the rest of his life to spreading the words of Jesus. Paul is a great example of forgiveness. God forgave Paul. God will forgive. Do not be afraid to ask. Okay, we are definitely living in a time where individuals are professing belief in God are declining in numbers. Uh, what would you tell those individuals that think there is no God? The individuals have to show the faith that is in their hearts. If they look around them, they'll see the beauty of God. If they listen as his words are presented, they will understand that there's truly a God. And if they follow a good life, they will have signs that God or the guides or angels are following them and are helping them to indeed live the life that they would like to live. In order to bring people back to organized religions, those religions have to have teachings that are very simple. They have to have teachings that the people can adapt to. It is very easy for any individual to understand the teachings of God. A church that puts themselves in front of the teachings of God 
will drive members away. Each individual needs to have the love of God in their heart and have an institution that will live up to their expectations. What do you see as the future for organized religions? Organized religions must change into the future. They have to understand that teachings must be believable and simplified. They have to be teachings that appeal to the people. A basis of the golden rule is a sound foundation for any religious organization. Everyone can understand that if you show anger towards others, they show anger back. And if you don't show anger, quite often they will not show anger to you. Simplicity. Simplicity is the key to the gr growth of religious organizations in the future. Okay, we've really enjoyed talking with you this evening. Uh, would you have a final message for us? Yes, thank you for trying, for giving me time to once again speak. In life, I enjoyed speaking to the groups, but I could never reach that many people. I guess my words were understood by many because it had great results. I thank you. I would return again if I was invited, because a good preacher never turns down an opportunity to speak. The final thought that I would like to leave your listeners with is remember the simplicity of God's message. It is truly a message of love, and it is a message of charity, and it is a message of doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. What could be more simple? So thank you for listening. If you ask me to come back, as I said, I'd be happy to do it. God bless all of you. Goodbye. Thank you so much, Martin. God bless you. Okay, thank you so much, Martin. Another great session. Next week, we're going to interview the 26th president of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt. He did more than any other president to create a national park system to presume, presume <laughs> preserving the areas of natural beauty in the United States. You can submit questions or recommendations for future shows in advance through our email, channeling history on parax at gmail.com. We would like to thank you for listening tonight. We have made our book, Channeling Jesus and the Holy Spirit, available on Kindle for only $2.99. It lays a great foundation of channeled information so thank you for listening join us again next week we will be live next week with the, with teddy roosevelt join us on sundays at 9 p.m eastern time on the para x radio network thank you all for joining us again this evening god bless you all have a wonderful week thanks for listening to channeling history Tune in again next week for another electrifying episode as we never know who will make an appearance or who will come through the portal. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2020. Our story begins by Kevin McLeod, licensed through Incompetech.com. <laughs>